Good evening, dear church. I hope everybody has had a great stay-at-home day or weekend so far. I know everybody, a lot of youth that I've talked to, they miss coming to church, they miss the gatherings, they miss singing together, they miss seeing each other. But thank God that we have this ability to, to do this online, to do this through technology today. Praise God for that. Before I start, I want to read Psalm 145. And I want, just, I want us just to listen to the way David talks about God and what he says. Psalm 145 starts with this. It says, I extol you, my God, O King, and I'll bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I'll praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works I will meditate. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness and I will shout joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your glory on your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known the sons of men your mighty acts and to the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bound down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food, and in due, you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and all flesh will bless his holy name. There are a number of themes to discuss in this passage. The author is King David and David speaks of God's mercy. He speaks of God's loving kindness. He speaks of God's splendor, his great works. So what am I going to talk about? Throughout this passage, throughout Psalm 145, you can see a common theme that David mentions. It doesn't mention it straightforward or um, you have to kind of look and read between the lines. This, this theme is the act of adoration of God. To adore is to have deep love and respect. It means to worship. Adoration of God means to show love and devotion to God. This is part of worship. It is to worship, to love, to honor, to show devotion to fear and to serve God. And scripture teaches us that God is worthy of it all. To adore God means to get on your knees and look to him to understand who we're standing before and say, God, you are good. God, you show me mercy every day. Your mercies are new every day. You satisfy all of my needs. But you don't stop there. You go above and beyond. You bless me with everything and more. I fall, but you pick me up every time. I run to you, and your arms are always open. You are a loving God who blesses your people with undeserved gifts. And the greatest gift being your son, Jesus Christ. The question that stands before us today, when was the last time that we got down on our knees just to adore God? When was the last time we opened this book, the Bible, and we just ran through it just to draw near to God, just to see him, just to look at him and his beauty, to be in awe of him, of who he is? 
It's a tough question to answer, I know, because every time I get on my knees, my mind goes straight to what I need. Then to make it sound pretty, we sometimes finish off with a short adoration of God. We say something like, God, you're great. We have the pause, we have the emotion involved in it, and then we say, amen. Is that it, though? Is that all he deserves? Is that all that God is worthy of? You're great. Bye. Isn't he worthy of much more? Back when I was in about ninth grade, I was sitting in history class, and we were discussing current events. I might have said this story before, but the teacher brought up a current event that happened. It was a courthouse that had the Ten Commandments displayed at, at its entrance. I don't remember where exactly. This was a while back when I was in ninth grade still. Some of you think I was born in the 50s. I'm not that aged yet. But somewhere in the U.S. there's a courthouse with the Ten Commandments. And it offended some people. As soon as you walk in, the Ten Commandments are staring you down. So my teacher brought this up because the discussion went on. Should they take it down because it offends some people? And the student raised his hand and he said, yes. Why is it that we need to see God every day? Church is for Sunday, God is for Sunday. Why should there be a reminder of church and God every day of the week? Let me tell you this, my teacher was Christian, so he began to play along with him. He said, yes, take it down, especially because it offends others, right? The student said, right. And the teacher said, I mean, Sunday is for God. He only deserves one day, right? And the student responds with, right. And the teacher said, I mean, all he did was send his son to die for you, right? And the student was now a little bit confused, and he goes, right, with just confused face on his, a confused look on his face. But it stuck with me. Until this day, the words of my ninth grade history teacher still ring in my head, is God really worth just Sunday? Is he really worth just, you're a great God? Thanks. At the end of our prayers. Any Christian who's ever heard a sermon or read the Bible obviously say, of course not. But then we get on our knees and the act of adoration of God is absent from our hearts. You know, due to our current stay-at-home status, we went from being one of the busiest nations in the world to almost an idle nation. People are still doing something, they're still traveling, moving along, but we're almost an idol. To be, to be idle means to almost stand still, to be not moving. When you leave your car in park and you just leave it running, that means it's idle, it's not moving. That's where we are today. We went from no time to almost all the time in the world. We went from busy, busy, busy to what am I going to do now? The biggest excuse we had is now gone. I have no time does not work for us anymore. And I'm going to say this right now, and I'm sure everyone knows it. Almost every Christian page on Facebook or Instagram or wherever you may look has or had something posted about this, but I'm still going to say it. If you don't know what to do, spend time in prayer and scripture. Easier said than done, I know. I didn't reveal anything new to anyone today. I didn't bring a new revelation. And of course, it's easy for me to stand up, up here and say this. I mean, I'll, I'll do it again. If you have nothing to do, then read the Bible and pray. Easy, especially when everyone is at home and not a lot of people are rolling. Easy to say for me when everybody's at home and not a lot of people are rolling their eyes at me. So if it's easier said than done, how, we how do we turn it into easier done than said? A.W. Tozer, who was a pastor and an author, said in his book, Pursuit of God, 
It remains for us to think on them and pray over them until they begin to glow within us. He's talking about certain truths. And we know this truth that if we have so much time on our hands, why do we not spend that time in prayer and study of scripture? We know this, all that's left for us to do is pray on them, pray over them, think on them. And I'll add one more is to actually do them. We look to these people. We look to famous Christian authors and theologians like A.W. Tozer. We look to Martin Luther, Charles Spurgeon, and Jonathan Edwards, uh, D.L. Moody, and anybody else. We look to them and quote them. We look to the Bible as well. We see David and how he spoke of God. We see Elijah and how he spoke of God. We see Paul and Peter and how they spoke of God. And we think to ourselves, these people were on a different level of spirituality. We think to ourselves that this level of spirituality is only reserved for a specific group of people. We think they're only reserved for pastors, for theologians, for scholars, and for other thinkers and leaders. That couldn't be further from the truth. We can praise and adore God all the same. We can look to God and read scripture and just stare at his beauty. We can read the Bible and be in awe of how amazing our God is. The adoration of God is not reserved for a specific group of people or specific person. This is for all sons and daughters of God. We can look to David in Psalm 145 to learn how to adore God. Actually, starting from Psalm 107 and all the way till the end of Psalm, this is a section of Psalms that talks about praise and worship of God. And we can learn from these authors on how to adore and worship and praise our God. In this time, as we stay at home, let's turn to God and just be in awe of him. Let us make time to just sit and stare at God. Sit and look at scripture and just be amazed of how great he is. Look up to him, look up to the sky and see the greatness of his works. See the works, the beauty he created around us. See the blessings that surround us. The mercy that pours over us. The blood that cleanses us. God is to be adored. He's to be worshipped. He's to be honored, loved, feared, and served. And he deserves all of this and more. Amen. Let us pray.